Florida Crossroads is produced with support from the Florida Department of Education. Visitors to the Florida Keys are easily lulled into believing they have left reality behind. Their senses tell them they have arrived in a sovereign tropical place known as the Conch Republic. Clearly the Queen Conch has become an icon here. But reality is harsh, ironic even. There are virtually no conch in the Conch Republic. Hello and welcome to Florida Crossroads. I'm Beth Switzer. In spite of the fascination with the Queen Conch as a symbol of the Florida Keys, everything that looks or tastes like a conch in the self-proclaimed Conch Republic must be imported from somewhere else. How did that happen and what can be done to resolve the situation? After all, the conch is more than just an ingredient in a bowl of chowder. In fact, the demise of a healthy conch population reaches deep into the area's ecology and economy. Conch Cowboys takes a rare behind-the-scenes look at the predicament of the conch. We invite you to join us as we track the Queen Conch in its historic range, from the Keys to the wider Caribbean. Along the way, we watch as the frontier science of mariculture tries to reverse the fortunes of the shell colored as pink as a Florida sunset. Under the shallow tropical waters of the wider Caribbean basin, in an ephemeral place that seems half real and half make-believe, there lives an animal unique in the entire world. Scientists describe this animal as Strombus gigas. It's a good name for the giant marine snail with a flared pink-lipped shell, a mollusk we know as the queen conch. As author Tom Robbins once observed, the conch shell is a calcified womb, a self-propelled nest, a house exuded by the dreams of its inhabitant. Inside this house of dreams is an enormous muscular foot, which the animal uses to move itself through our near shore coastal waters, through seagrass pastures and sand flats, and at the edges of our technicolor coral reefs. Because it ranges over a wide diversity of marine habitats, the conch can even be considered a keystone species, a critter by which we can measure the health of its larger environment. Since humans have both admired and consumed the conch for centuries, it has also nurtured a certain cultural ambience, helping create a place of maritime whimsy, where giant pink shells take on a life all their own. But now it is threatened by overfishing and habitat loss. In Florida, it is illegal to harvest any conch, and all conch products must now be imported, even to the so-called Conch Republic. For the first time, the conch's survival depends on how wisely humans can wrangle it, on land or in the sea. A conch is a marine snail, not unlike the garden variety snails, except these grow in the sea. They actually feed off of plant material. They don't eat any animal material. We estimate that there are about uh, 12 to 15,000 individuals within these breeding aggregations offshore from west of Key West to Key Largo. Our entire Keys, Queen Conch population, really can fit into one small location in the Bahamas. To help rebalance the natural equation, scientists like Glazier are turning to mariculture, the ancient practice of fish farming, updated and transferred to the ocean. We can think of Glazier and his colleagues as cowboys, riding herd on the vast range of the sea. We have a holistic program that is designed to 
identify and to monitor the populations, the wild populations in Florida, and to determine the best way to mitigate the losses that have occurred over decades of uh, over-harvesting and resource depletion. We're examining a variety of methods to rehabilitate the population, one of which is the hatchery, which you see here. This is the nursery area of the hatchery, where we grow the juveniles. What we have done is we've developed a technique where we tag individual conch with an aluminum tag that's numbered, and we find them using a metal detector. If we hadn't used the metal detector, uh, we would recover about 16%, but with a metal detector, we can recover about 93% of the ones that we've outplanted. Mariculture by trial and error has revealed just how complex the life cycle of the conch really is. Not only does the mollusk need clear, clean water in which to live, it must learn how to cope with life. Experiments show young farmed conch exposed to predators like spiny lobster grow thicker, more protective shells than those with no such experience. In simpler times in the Florida Keys, before streamlined roads, bridges, and air travel opened the door to development, everything moved at a slower pace, more closely tuned to the rhythms of nature. For the natives, known colloquially as conchs, it seemed as if the sea and its bounty were infinite. There was the, the conchs all over the Keys on the ocean side. Uh, I could go out in 30 minutes, 40 minutes, get a sack full of conchs. Today, if I tell stories that happened when I was a boy, nobody would understand and believe them. Everything has changed. Now, this was Ernest Hemingway's favorite hangout. Proud to be a conch on both sides of my family. I took it right on the conch train one time, and I said, let me get off. <laughs> I was a great advocate of conch hatchery. I went down to... Um, Kaikos, where they have a conch hatchery. We all agreed that what we needed on the Keys was hatchery, conch hatchery. Man, we love our conch, you know. Conch steak, you tasted conch steaks, I guess. Uh, conch chowder, at least once a week I have conch chowder, you know. Nearby, on the edge of the historic Key West Bight Harbor, where working fishing boats once docked, one restaurateur wants not only to serve conch, but to help educate consumers to its plight. Conch and the Keys, as you know, have uh, been protect as a protected species. And yet, conch was the basis of, the, of food here, traditionally, for the last 250 years. We'll be serving very traditional dishes that you would find in the Bahamas. Uh, we would hope to have people here actually knocking the conch and creating the salads right on, right on our waterfront. We are also, we have a whole uh, education center which will really focus on the conch where we'll be uh, warehousing uh, a number of thousand of conch where people will be able to go back and to learn about that. We also, our menu will reflect all the stories and and uh, the myths and that surrounding comp. There's already more demand than there is product. At the Chica Lodge in the Upper Keys, Dawn Sieber is doing everything she can to protect seafood stressed by human impacts. What's happened is the conch have become an endangered species uh, since I was growing up down here when you could take them because they were very prevalent um, and I knew that uh, when I started working here 10 years ago as a chef. It's very common to feature conch in the Florida Keys on your menus and I knew that but I knew that it was an endangered species so I chose not to uh, and my company supported me. I've really gone to extremes to find the freshest available product and what I find with a lot of the farmed products like the conch is that they're actually in a way fresher from the farms than they would be from the local waters because you're skipping the middleman, you're skipping it's directly farm to chef. The way that they're handling the conch, they're keeping them live until they get to me. As a chef, I would like to really encourage the aquaculture industry to continue um, very heavily in making great strides in producing more because um, right now there are not as many farms as there are chefs who probably need product, which is unfortunate because I would certainly be able to buy more. Um, 
conch, redfish, striped bass, that kind of thing. Way out beyond the bustle and neon of the overseas highway, there are places where you can almost believe time is standing still. If you visit this back country of remote islands and red mangroves and clear waters, you might forget there is a conch dilemma at all. I now have this vision of what was like when I was a little kid and I had my first boat when I was 10. So from 10 to 13, I was cut loose in this kind of place where I could play and I saw it falling back and that's what made me an activist. Over time, Captain Victoria has come to care not just for the conch, but to embrace the larger message of marine ecology. There's so many different animals in the sea that eat conch and the octopus will crawl in and you name it. It's just a lot of different things that can get to them besides us. If all of us give back enough from the mariculture and leave nature alone, Nature will feed the ones that need to get fed because we're, we've imbalanced by taking the fish as well uh, in some ways. So we've got to leave food for the fish that are left and try to help things to come back into balance. Yet, if farming conch can produce more of the tasty pink-lipped shellfish, the Florida Keys still has a dilemma it must resolve before any hatchery can successfully revitalize local waters. The conchs were in fact were returning and they were quite large. They were the broad-lipped conch. They were out there and we were kind of excited to see the return of the conch. There was there even talk about opening up harvesting the conchs again. There were so many of them. And then over the last five years, the water quality has degraded to the point where we haven't seen the numbers of conchs we've seen on the reef. A lot of the conchs we do see have algae. I just had a report recently of, of a major conch area, conch bed, that had um, the red encrusting fire coral, I mean fire sp um, sponge, this red sponge growing on the backs of the, the conchs. Now this will eventually eat the way through the conch shell and kill the conch. So what we're looking at is this fire sponge is, is a water quality related event. As water quality declines, so does the conch population. Well, it's a matter of learning how to live with the environment is our biggest challenge right now. Not reducing the number of people, because that's, that's really hard to do, but reducing the impact that the people have on the coral, on the coral reef, the near shore waters, infrastructure, sewage needs, pump out on boats, stormwater runoff, things like that. These things aren't unique just to Key West either. They're happening all over the Caribbean. Back at Florida's first and only state-sponsored conch hatchery, scientist Bob Glazier has also discovered that conch simply won't grow well in the nutrient-enriched nearshore waters of the Keys. We have a couple ideas why they don't spawn anymore near shore, and really we are thinking that it has to relate to uh, water quality conditions. In our hatchery where we grow the larvae uh, through their planktonic stage, in other words through the stage when they're swimming around and they're microscopic, we uh, notice that we can't grow them at all if we just take water from near shore. However, if we take the water from near shore and treat it very intensively uh, so that it actually more represents the offshore water conditions, uh, then we can grow them in about 20 times the density in about half the time. If you talk to some of the old timers that lived here for a long time, they will tell you that the water near shore used to be gin clear and now it's emerald green, and that's a result of water quality changes in the nearshore area. So while it may look pristine, there are some changes that have occurred over time. Meanwhile, in another archipelago also washed by the warm seas of the South Atlantic, a British crown colony known as the Turks and Caicos Islands provides not only a look at what the Keys used to be, it also promises an encouraging vision for the future, both for the conch and the cowboys who would wrangle it. We have been exporting conch to the United States, and I understand um, some of that conch even goes to Europe and we have the reputation in the Turks and Caicos Islands of having the best conch in the world. The conch is what it eats, and because our environment is so pristine, um, the conch turns out having the whitest meat and the most tender and the tastiest meat of any conch anywhere else in the world. It goes back 
a very long time. My grandparents tell me that there was a time when conch was the main trading product. They would take the conch, beat the conch, dry it, and go to Haiti and sell it, and they would come back with produce. It was like bartering. It was money, actually, in that context. And um, that's before even lobster was exported. If you would know, the conch is also on our coat of arms. We recognize the fact that it has played a very vital role in the economic sustainability of the economy. We have done various studies with the assistance of um, the British government. Our marine biologists come in. We know where the conchs are. We know where they breed. We have um, information as to how they breed thanks to um, the local conch farm here. On the island of Providencialis, the Caicos conch farm and its fenced 60-acre aquatic pasture perches on the cusp between land and sea. Although the vision of it may seem fanciful, the farm is in the serious business of growing livestock, just like terrestrial farms raise cattle or hogs. In this way, it not only takes pressure off the heavily fished local wild conch population, it offers the chance for locals to remain close to the oceanic environment that has nurtured them for generations. Here, conch cowboys and girls ride a turquoise range to her giant pink-lipped snails. In between roundups, they wrangle tourists as well. This is Jared. This is his two eyes on the end of the tentacles. Mm. Spout and water. This is his mouth, or the proboscis that he eat with, his mouth. This is the foot, and the claw, or the operculum on the end of the foot. It's like a toenail. Mm. And he used it to move around with it as a form of protection. The orange the parts of the mantle is where he formed conch pearls. A grain of sand get into the orange part. Irritate him turns into a pretty pink pearl. Mm. They're real, you find one in 15,000. The farm is the actualized dream of Chuck Hess, a Naval Academy grad who took refuge in these islands when a storm interrupted a sailing trip 25 years ago. Hess has been here ever since, first working with locals on grassroots conservation projects and later raising conch from egg to export. In this new science of sea farming, Hess is the consummate conch cowboy. He literally mends fences, scouts for predators hungry for his livestock, and even directs periodic roundups. When you have a 60-acre pasture like we do at the farm, and when you dream on expanding that to 200 acres, you soon discover that much like the sheep herder or much like the cattle rancher, the responsibilities are the same. You've got daily checking of fences, which in this case we swim instead of riding our horse to check. Um, you have predators that come in. In our case, it might be locking the nurse shark or the porcupine fish in the hen house. It requires that you do check your fences regularly. It requires that you go out and you harvest. It's all done by hand. It's all done by snorkeling. It's all done by diving. What the farm is attempting to do is not save just a species like the snail darter, but a commercially endangered species where the impact is measured in thousands of tons, not 20 or 30 hooping cranes or 40 or 11 iguanas. We're trying to bring back an entire industrial base. People often have asked me, why did you pick the queen conch to farm? Why not grow the spiny lobster? Why not grow the Nassau grouper? Why not grow the snapper? And the answer is because I spent a year and a half as a diver in the water, and I realized that everything else in the ocean, in the Caribbean, pretty much depends on the conch as a source of food. So if we don't restore this animal that eats grass and turns it into meat so that all of the other lobsters, groupers, snappers, rays, nurse sharks, octopus have a food source, they're going to suffer in terms of their normal positions in the ecosystem. If you take away that bottom line that converts grass to what the rest of them want to eat, you're jeopardizing the whole thing. When we're trying to maintain a fence, we often see a place like this where the um, bait fish has gotten caught 
as a change in tide, and then what happens is the barracudas come over and see a nice meal, and they take a big chunk out of the fence. And we're left with a hole that lets the next bigger predator, like a porcupine fish, come through, or a lobster can crawl up this and come through. So on a routine basis, we have to come out here and put this fence back together again using the modern man's equivalent to a staple, which is a tie wrap. This animal, because it is the true chicken of the sea, everybody wants to eat it. One of the reasons we have to be so careful with maintaining the fence is that we're dealing with an animal that if we lose it to a predator that's a big predator, like a spotted eagle ray or a southern ray or a nurse shark, we're losing an animal that's been cared for for three years. So it'd be like losing your prized steer. It'd be like losing a very a, a lamb that's ready to go to market. Is this a Learning to grow conch begins with hatching microscopic eggs into a floating larvae called villagers. They were up in the algae room and these tanks all around you, they used to grow algae. We grow algae to feed the villagers and the very small conch. We have two different species, Isochrysis and Catoceros. We go collect egg masses from our egg farm out by the reef. We bring them in, we hatch them out, which takes several days. We put them in the big tanks. And then, we, and then they stay there for three weeks. At that point, they're kind of microscopic, and then they grow to about a millimeter in size. Then they, they lose their lobes and ability to swim, and they start to settle out on the bottom. They look like little miniature conch. They have a shell. They keep that sh same shell throughout their life, and the shell just grows with it as they grow inside. In the wild, you get about one out of half a million surviving. One out of every egg mass will survive. We've increased that by about uh, hundreds and hundreds of times. We get about 2,700 per egg mass to survive. Every year we put through about 4 million larvae through the system, and that gives us about a million adult conch in the, in the end of four years. We had to develop all this on our own. No one knew how to grow, grow them, how to feed them, what to feed them, or anything like that. So we had to develop all these techniques on our own. All this stuff you see around you was specially made for the conch farm. We made it on site, um, or it was made up in the States and shipped down here. But the story of the conch is also the story of the ocean, especially the shallow, reef-studded tropical seas where the animal lives. While the near shore waters of the Turks and Caicos remain clear and healthy, tourism here, like the Florida Keys, is driven by the ocean. And the ocean has a strong lure indeed. Each year, more and more tourists are coming for the flavor of the Caribbean. And one of the things that's the flavor of the Caribbean is to try conch. Well, 20 years ago, the Turks and Caicos maybe had 10,000 visitors. This year, we have 100,000 visitors, and we're the smallest island undergoing development. If people leave their imprint on the environment by their very presence, then they also affect the local culture. British loyalists once settled here to grow cotton and sisal in plantations, cobbling together homes from limestone using a mortar of ground conch shell. When they left in the early 1800s, their slaves remained to become the ancestors of today's islanders. What legacy will today's humans leave behind for the future of the sea, the islands, and the culture that is inextricably woven into it all? Certainly, mariculture offers hope, but the dedicated work of the conch cowboys doesn't allow us to relinquish our own responsibilities for taking care of our water planet. And 
the creatures who live in it. Anybody want to pack Jerry and Gentry? The Queen Conch has reached a perilous point in its existence. If it survives, its success as a species will reflect well on our long-range skills to ride herd on the sea itself. The message is a metaphoric one. To be a good steward of the conch, we have to mend the fences of the larger pasture in which it lives. After all, the waters of South Florida and the Keys don't end at the state boundary, but extend both upstream and downstream for hundreds of miles. Thanks for joining us. Here's some of what you'll see next time on Florida Crossroads. Bill loved his life. He, he loved everything about his life, his spiritual life, his social life. He loved to play bridge. He loved his family life. He, he loved his life, and, and he didn't he didn't want to lose his life. I think the workshop helped him and me to find some meaning in his death. One lasting gift, next time on Florida Crossroads. Additional support for this program was provided by the Biscayne Bay Foundation, the Henry Foundation, and the Coral Reef Fund of the National Philanthropic Trust. questions or comments about this program, you can email us at florida at wfsu.org or call us at area code 850-488-1281. For more information about Florida Crossroads and other episodes in the series, log on to our website, thefloridachannel.org. You can also view recent programs of Florida Crossroads in our archives section.